go. Check, check, check. Everything's checked, Rach. You got your volume work? We're good to go? Check, check, check. You might have to turn yours up, but so <laughs> you can figure that out while I introduce Stephen Pressfield, who is with us today. So, so Stephen, first of all, thank you for joining us today as we've been talking about doing this for a little while now and to be able to finally get a chance to talk to you. I just told you as before I press play, um, I'm like a little kid in a candy shop who gets to talk to uh, a guy who I've read about and read your art and read your work and now to be able to talk to you uh, with Rachel with me next to me and, and a very good friend of mine as well. What an absolute honor here on a, on a little Tuesday morning to just first and foremost, man, nice to see you, nice to talk to you and thank you for joining us. Likewise, thanks for inviting me. I hope I just don't disappoint you too much. <laughs> well, let's, let's let it rip. Yeah, let's let it rip. So you are out in L.A. We're in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We just got done working out. And uh, and as I told you, I read Turning Pro, which as I've kind of prepared for this and be able to talk to you, you have a lot more work than just obviously that. Like I said, in kind of our inner circle, we're reading The War of Art and then the book that you just talked about again before we press play. But you have a large body of work, uh, a lot of stuff. And before we kind of peel into specific things so we can kind of let the listeners kind of understand, can you just give us an overlay of what you do, how your life looks, just kind of how things are, and then we'll take it from there. Well, I've been a writer for my whole life, you know, struggling for many years to get going. Yeah. And maybe around, uh, I don't know, 25 years ago, uh, I finally started getting published. And I've done a bunch of books, uh, The Legend of Bagger Vance, that became a terrible movie, but it's a really good book. And uh, I've done a bunch of books uh, set in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. You may have heard of Gates of Fire. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it's a required reading at the West Point, the Naval Academy and places like that, you know, and, I, and, uh, and I've done a bunch of um, books that you would say are, are about kind of uh, the warrior code or that kind of thing, which sort of bleeds over into athletics, as you know. Mm -hmm. And then I think maybe uh, 18 years ago, um, you know, when you're a writer, people come to you all the time and they say, <laughs> I've got a book in me, you know, I'm just, it's ready to come, you know? And many times I sort of would sit up till two in the morning with friends trying to psych them up, uh, you know, to, to actually face the blank page and do their thing, you know, and of course they never did. It. And so I decided one time, all these things that I'm telling people, I'm just going to put them in a little book. And then next time people come to me, I say, just here, read this, you know? <laughs> and so that was kind of how the war of art, came about that wow. you you're about to read on. yeah yeah and then that had a really good reception it's closing in on i think a million sales right now wow after 18 years kind of a slow process so i did a few follow-ups to that and turning pro was the first one wow and uh so i sort of had this double body of work there's kind of novels and then there's just nonfiction stuff that's about writing and about the sort of the inner discipline of facing our demons of procrastination and self-doubt and and also the other side of it, arrogance and complacency and all of the things that make you not want to go to the gym and not want to work out and not push yourself to your limits. Yeah. So that's that's my sort of quick background. So you said something that I think is rather cool for Rachel and I too, without going deep into our backgrounds, but what I really liked, and I maybe this hit home with you as well, but you said that it was a long, a long journey to even get published. So yeah. before that, cause I only know you, Rachel and I only know you or know of you as you've been incredibly published, right? I mean, you're talking about millions of copies on one singular piece of work type deal and then everything else inside of that. So I know you at this level uh, and have heard about you and read about you at this work. What was the what was the what was the mindset or the way you thought in your earlier days? Like, obviously, it sounds like there was a lot of trying to figure that out and make that happen. You're talking to two people who are dreamers, if you will. We talked all night yeah. last night about dreaming. And yeah. uh, and I think in our shoes, we kind of just try to work as hard as we can, appreciate the art, master our craft, and see us doing that, what we want, having our visions come to life at some point. So you obviously had that happen, and then it did happen, and now it's happening. 
what was it like before you were getting published? What was your mindset? What was your curiosities? What kind of questions did you ask yourself? And how did you continue to not procrastinate? Uh, it's a hell of a question. And the answer, I could answer that over like weeks. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I mean, I, I lived for a while in my van, you know, and I was, uh, um, I worked like, I don't know, 25 different jobs, you know, doing various things. And it was a long, long process. I think from the time I first tried to write to like I published was like 30 years. Wow. And now part of that time, I was working as a professional writer. I was a screenwriter and I worked in advertising as well. So part of that time I was at least in my field, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but not doing what I wanted to do. And, um, but like, uh, just as an example of how you sort of keep going through this thing. I mean, I felt like maybe you guys feel the same way. Like I really didn't have any choice. You know, if I were to, there was no plan B, you know, um, like one of the things I used to do is I, I would work in advertising in New York, save money, quit, write a novel. You know, I'd move to some place that was cheap, write a novel. Nobody would buy it. I go crawling back to New York, work again, quit again. I did this three different times and over like a, I don't know, 12 year period or something. And what would happen is each time I would go to my boss and I would say, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go write a novel with the most well-meaning, you know, care and love, they would say to me, Steve, don't throw your life away. You know, what are you doing? You know, you know, uh, stay here. We'll give you a promotion, blah, blah, blah. Right. And each time I would go home that night and I would be in a state of you know, hysteria and I would say, you know, they're right. They're right. I'm just going to, I'm failing. I'm never going to get anywhere, but I could never take the job. I always quit. And so I just feel that uh, some of us that are driven to do something and just don't have a plan B, I just, uh, and I, I guess along the way, and maybe you guys can relate to this, I would get enough, just enough success to kind of keep me going, you know, yeah. I would be, at least be able to pay the rent. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do, but I was kind of in the field, you know? Yeah. So it was just a long, long process and through the whole thing. I mean, my family would shake their heads at me, you know, my brother would throw up his hands. My parents, you know, didn't know what was wrong with me. Was I insane? You know, yeah. uh, I just couldn't, couldn't stop. You know, I, I know just like, I guess from looking at Rachel, that just, <laughs> she, she, she sounds my, like she has my neck she hurts from like see, nodding my head so much. See if uh, is if this working? Oh yeah, this working? sounds good. Okay. Yeah. I know you have something to say. Yeah, that's a, my that's neck a is like a little bit Rachel. sore from <laughs> nodding my head so hard. I just, a couple of things that like jumped out to me there were, um, you first used the verbiage. You said you felt like you had to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to ask a question because I hold a certain belief about this, but do you think that everyone actually has a calling in life? I do, but I, but I may be deluded in saying that. No, know? I agree. I mean, maybe I'm just projecting, but I, I do think so. Um, Although the calling might be an odd call, you know, mm -hmm. um, it might be political. It might be, you know, I see, you see these shows on TV about guys that build motorcycles, custom motorcycles, you know, and they're fantastic. I mean, that's a call. Yes. I mean, that's an artistic call. Yes. And there will be lots of things. So yeah, I do. I do feel that. That's um, what um, I want to like, I want to piggyback off of that one. So the question is though, because you had this calling in you and you kept going, you kept moving away and then, and then yeah. it would fail. You'd go back and everyone would go, see, told you, you can't do it. <laughs> and then you're like, no, I know I have to do this. I have to do this. And like, I've, I've definitely had similar experiences where people are like, why are you putting yourself through this? And I'm like, I, because I know that I have a special gift based off of my, the experiences that I've been afforded through mentors, through my parents, through whatever, I know that I have this very special, perfect storm. And I think everyone actually has that, but either they don't realize it or they realize it, but they're too afraid to do what you did or what, you know, I mean, all three of us have done that to some degree and you're definitely way further along your journey. But I believe everyone has a calling, but most people don't even realize what their special gift is for the world or they realize it and they, they just, it's too hard to go after. 
I think that's true. And of course, nobody teaches you this. Right. No. You know, when you're in school, you know, usually they tell you you're a loser, you know, yeah. you're, you know, or they try to fit you into a pigeonhole type of thing, you know, and with all the best intentions, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, like my dad grew up in the depression mm-hmm. and, you know, they lost everything. It's that. So his fondest wish for me was that I just get a job that I could count on. Yeah. You know, he wanted to be in, me to be an engineer, you know, and I really bought into that, you know, for the longest time. So nobody teaches you that you have a calling and that you should follow it and that kind of thing. And so you're right. A lot of people don't, don't know it. They don't have that mindset. I mean, it took me years and years and years to sort of even get that mindset. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you knew, like you could feel that for so long, you just didn't know how to really articulate it. And then writing was an outlet of getting your thoughts on paper. It was was more of when I wrote, this was my best way to explain what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking. Uh, No, okay. not that. Like, because I I just, yeah, go ahead. You just wanted to be a writer, you know, like Hemingway or Henry Miller or any of those guys, I just wanted to do that. Uh, so I wasn't trying to put my thoughts on paper. I was trying to tell stories. And so then with that, like what genre, how did you pick the style in which you write? Cause your style, again, I, I have not read all of your art, but from the style that I have, uh, you have a very unique, like I was trying to explain it to Rachel. It's like a very, uh, when I read your, when I read your, when I read your stuff, I feel like it's very direct. Like it's like this is what I'm, this is what I need to gather. It's concise. It's like do this and here. He said boom. dark. He said dark. <laughs> it's heavy. Well, it's just heavy, heavy, heavy in a good way. Like I felt That's like it, I took it as heavy. Like I, I read it as this is heavy, good, direct. You need to sit and think on your life uh, with what you're reading, and that's how I, I think of. I just categorize that as mm-hmm. heavy. Mm-hmm. But I well, like that, it like that. <laughs> well, that uh, the sort of the short answer is that it just took forever. It took 30 okay. years or more to do that. And if if you or if anybody were to kind of read my earlier stuff mm-hmm. from way back when, they wouldn't even recognize it. And I wouldn't recognize it. So it is kind of a long process. I'm sure you guys can relate to this, too, of sort of finding your voice, you know? Yeah. And you try different things you know it's like if you watch some of these documentaries about rock bands Mm -hmm. you know or even like something like uh, spinal tap where they're mocking it you know where they go the guy will be or they'll be in some great band and they'll say well i used to be in this band called you know the happy wanderers and then before that we were called the sharks and then before that you know we were called the the whatever yeah and then so it's a real process of evolution of for me at least of trying on other voices mm-hmm. trying other trying to find something that i thought was my voice but i could never get it you know and i think eventually though you do get it you know? that's another you really like something that's unique and i think i believe that something is a common thread in a lot of successful people is that you just were okay with shedding your skin and doing different things and going and not saying, okay, I'm, I want to stay and do this type of writing my entire career. You just were like, no, as who am I as you, as you evolved as a person, your writing evolved. And I just went through a career change myself and, and was able to just like completely let go of what I was before. But so many people are wrapped up in the identity of, of what they were doing previously. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was very happy to shed those skins, Mm -hmm. you know, because they weren't working, you know, it was like, well, this sucks, you know, let me find, uh, you know, please make this one work, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't mind shedding any of those skins because they weren't working. Well, lots of people stay in their skin that isn't working. Yeah. So it's like, because so you're like, well, it it wasn't working, but plenty of people it ain't working, you know, not, yeah. I guess you had a clear, I mean, like, it really wasn't working. Right? Yeah. So I was really unhappy day to day. And yeah. It wasn't something I could maintain. Yeah. How do you, so just to help Rachel and I, cause neither of us have necessarily dove down the writing world, but when you uh, talk about like the improvement in your writing changed to where if you read what you wrote 30 years ago, it's different to now, how does the like process of development in writing get but not from like a, a a buyer's perspective, right? Like if you if I if you have a book that sells a lot, obviously the outcome of that looks like it was a really positive book. But how do you know that your writing is improving without necessarily the um, validation from like the buyer or the outside world? Like how do you know that you're becoming a better writer, a better thinker, a better storyteller? 
Hmm. That's, a, that's a great question. I'm sure that, first of all, I, sh- I want to say that I think what I'm talking about writing, mm-hmm. I'm sure applies to what you guys are doing directly. You know, yeah. it's just a metaphor for it. Yes. You know? um, but um, I, I do think you can, you can just tell you know, you, you learn lessons as you go along, you know, uh, and, and at the start of a certain year, you might know, you think you know a lot. And then, you know, maybe in February, you have kind of breakthrough and you learn something that you never knew. You go, oh, wow, I never realized that was a principle of storytelling or something like that. And by the end of the year, and you've had a couple more of those breakthroughs, you can say, you, you do feel it. You sort of feel, you know, I am getting better. It must work for your field as well. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Being athletes or being an athlete. Yeah. I think you you just feel it. You do know you're getting better. I'm sure Michael Jordan, yeah. you know, when he perfected a turnaround fadeaway jump shot, he could feel, oh, I'm now I can elevate beyond I get, you know, and mm-hmm. he knows he's getting better, I think. Yeah. Well, so you because you tell stories, right? Like you're essentially trying to like are you thinking to yourself, how am I how are we hearing the story? Or are you just trying to master your craft of telling the story? Like, is it more of a, a feedback from the audience that gets you your your improvement? Or is it just just keep pounding the, the pavement, like keep writing and writing and writing and see what... It's, it's both. Yeah. A lot of it is pounding the pavement. But I also think, and this applies to you guys too, I'm sure, mm-hmm. as any writer, you know, or a songwriter or anything like that, as you're t- writing your story you're also projecting yourself into the mind of the reader. You're kind of constantly asking yourself, or I am, yeah. you know, is this boring? You know, is this chapter, am I, when this chapter ends, does the reader want to f- keep going? Yeah. Have I left them on sort of, so you're sort of, you know, you're, you're, you're putting your mind into the reader's mind constantly. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure singers do or comedians do or anybody you get up on stage, you're kind of wondering, is the audience responding? Are they getting it? You know, are they laughing? Are they cheering? Um, it's harder for a writer, of course, because you do your whole finished entire book and you have no feedback whatsoever. Right. And yeah. it goes out. Yeah. But, um, that but is yeah, it's a little bit about a lot of it too, Harvey, is you really are beating your brains out. <laughs> thinking, you know, I've got to get, it isn't working. I've got to get it working. Well, so that's awesome answer. So, cause I think about it and I was actually, I think I was talking to you about this last night, uh, either you or Tommy, but I was, I was thinking when you are, you know, I care when you're having a conversation, like when I'm listening to you, if we're not on a podcast necessarily, if we had just met up and we're having a cup of coffee and you're telling me a story, a lot of times in conversation, I'm just thinking about my own thoughts or my own feelings because uh-huh. I'm getting ready to either respond to you or Rachel uh-huh. or in the conversation. Whereas I could get, I could not be in your mind. So this is where like a lot of translation gets lost just in human connection or conversation is that we could spend this whole hour talking. I'm just telling things from my experiences. And then right when I'm done talking, you're doing the same thing back. And then we leave and I never actually got to see the world through your lens or even try to understand what you're saying. So that's where I, it's so cool what you do is you get people to how I think of it is when I read your work, you get me to think about my life, but it's coming from your brain. (laughs) Like you're the one that wrote it. And then, but it's somehow from your experiences, making me think about my experiences. And again, it's not, and it's not like I called you right after I read turning pro and said, Hey, this is exactly what I felt. Here's the feedback. Like I just moved on with, with my day, you know, and didn't know if I'd ever uh-huh. talk to you, but uh-huh. it, I just think about that. By the way, Harvey, I give you a lot of credit for reaching out and for doing that. A lot of people would not do that. A lot of people would be afraid to do that, you know? Yeah. So I take my hat off to you for, for doing it. And, you know, hopefully it's, it's working. Oh, it's cool. Well, it's cool just asking you these questions because uh, I just, it's, I, I think of it as in people who are so masterful in their craft, they can get, are you ever, I guess where I was going with that comment and that question is, do you ever find yourself so much trying to understand people that it becomes almost uh, frustrating because you're just always trying to think of what are people thinking? What is the conversation? Am I th- like, is it, is, how have you learned how to control your own language in your head to be 
not I'm all. Not sure, I quite understand the question. Can do you, you have? That a little bit? Yeah, are you? Do you, would you consider yourself an empathetic person, yeah. where you are very good at being in tune with how someone is going to receive what you're putting out? Uh, I I do. I don't know if I am. I yeah. but <laughs> I think that's kind of part of the process for being a writer or like a comedian or a songwriter or something like that is being able to project yourself into the the reader or the audience's. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, how they're receiving what you're saying mm -hmm. and also what, what their needs are coming into the thing, even before they know who you are. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the, of the, of the craft of doing it. And when you're, when you're doing this and you're writing, so when you think about how I want to tell stories, I want to be a writer. What is the, I guess the, your why, like, what are you trying to teach the audience like what has been the when you sit down and you start writing i want to tell the world about x or about this or how to live like this how does that go formulate in your head okay i'm going to give you a really deep answer on i this love one. it Get, take us Bring take it. us deep Bring we it. got our floaties on Feed steve me. <laughs> i i really believe that uh, that a lot of artists and writers have no idea including me mm -hmm. have no idea what they're doing have no idea why they're why they're writing a certain thing. You know, I'm I'm a believer in the muse, you know, and the goddess that inspires people. And when, you know, like, um, you know, I wrote as I said before, I wrote like five books that were set in the ancient world about ancient Sparta, ancient Athens, Rome, Alexander the Great. And when I before I wrote those books, I had no idea in the world that I would write them. It wasn't like there was I had this you know, concept in my mind that I wanted to communicate to the world. Absolutely not. It was like those things kind of came to me. Yeah. Like assignment and, and surprised me. They, everything new, every new book surprises me. Yeah. So I think like me writing that, why? I don't know anything about that, you know? And so I'm, it was as though, and I really believe this, that stories kind of exist in the atmosphere you know, in another in potential, and they sort of tap into a writer, tap them on the shoulder, and say, you know, it's your job to write this sucker. <laughs> and the person, it's almost like, uh, you know, Jesus and the disciples. You know, <laughs> where us, we're supposed to go up. You know, and, yes. And so I, I kind of feel as I'm writing a story a lot of times that I'm I'm just in the service of that story, wow. and I'm just I'm trying to sort of bring my That's skills cool. to bear so that uh, I'm bringing, trying to bring it into the material world in a form that people will be able to understand and read, you know, mm -hmm. I'm hoping it's going to be fun. It's exciting. It'll be interesting. Um, but I'm really at kind of at the service of, of that story. So very definitely, Harvey, I do not feel like I have a message that I'm trying to put out there, absolutely not. Maybe in the war of art and in turning pro, that that is true. Yeah. Because those were sort of lessons I've learned in my own struggles in isolation. Sure. And I wanted to kind of pass them on to people, but you know, hopefully it will be helpful to them. But um, in terms of a story idea, I, I don't have any message at all. Yeah. I'm just trying. It kind of comes from a mysterious place, and. Uh, I'm trying to put it in a form that's assimilatable and digestible and tastes good. You know? Yeah. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. yeah that's I can't, beautiful. I can't tell you like that is it. You just described it in a very artistic manner, but I, I can't, I couldn't relate more to everything you just said. Like, I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't know what happened, but some God, Buddha, the unit muse, I don't care who you say it is. It's like, I'm supposed to be doing what I'm doing right now. And, you know, I was telling, I don't think it was you, but it was like, somebody out there is supposed to cure cancer. Somebody out there is supposed to write uh -huh. these stories. Somebody out there is supposed to be creating art through motorcycles. Somebody, but for me, I know exactly why I'm here. And it's like, I don't know why, you know, and I'm not trying to necessarily, I'm not trying to create the message. The message came to me, as you yeah. said, and I'm just living it out. I'm just, I'm just living to the fullest of my ability to, like be the vehicle for the message. 
What uh, what is the message, Rachel? What's the message that you're <laughs> so to yeah? So Harvey just kind of threw me on you. So just a snippet, maybe for the listeners if they don't that's know. How I, well, that's how I roll. Yeah, just he just <laughs> threw you in the de- you're in the deep end now. You didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just like a tiny little snippet. Fast forward. I am um, I work for the New York Yankees. I'm a minor league hitting coach, and um, I'm the first full time female hitting coach in Major League Baseball to be hired by an organization. And then also before that, I was the first ever female full-time strength and conditioning coach, um, in 2014 to be hired. And so, um, I've had some pretty unique experiences, all of the things that you were talking about with, um, doing the work behind the scenes. Nobody knows. I don't know if I'm getting, I don't know if I'm good. I don't know if I'm bad. I don't know if I'm good. <laughs> like not having any feedback for a while there. Uh, I still don't know if I'm good. So I'm still kind of in that process, but, um, so I don't know why, but I've had all these very unique experiences in my life that have enabled me to do this job. I don't think that every woman could do this job, but somehow my parents, early mentors, certain really strange experiences tra- in my travels, et cetera, have enabled me to be successful in this position to stay around long enough. And I, I believe I'll be around for a long time, but I'm, I just think about all these things that have kind of happened or things that have come to me, people that have come to me, conversations that have come to me. And I just think like, how did this happen? (laughs) I don't know how, but I just know. And I love that you said also, uh, you're, you're not only delivering the message, but you're trying to make it taste good. So people want it. And I, I take that to heart as well. Just knowing that I'm very, very aware of just how I'm presented in the media, how I present myself online, et cetera. That's important and it needs to be palatable for young women so that they w- want to enjoy my story the same uh-huh. way that they want you know you want people to uh-huh. enjoy your book i want young women to see to be able to see themselves in my role someday so do you feel that you have an actual m- message rachel like you could boil it down into yeah you know a book or a video you do yeah just i mean i'm not asking you to tell me what it is but you do have it huh? yeah and I could tell you simply, it's just yeah, it's just me. empowering empowering young women to create ah. a, an, a tangible idea of what was is possible for them. I guess. Ah, and is that message evolving with you? Um. Yeah. From year to year, does it does it take a different, slightly different form, or deepen itself? It deepens. It. De- I I would say that that's. I've probably been this way since I was like ten. But uh-huh. it deepens and it, it it evolves. But I've probably felt this way consciously since I was in high school. But for sure, even when I was like ten, I was just doing uh-huh. stuff different. Well, that rings bells with me. I think you, that that's, yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. Well, t- about you mean when you were young and like knowing right away when you were young, or or well, you mean funny, not so much myself, but mm-hmm. characters that I've written about, mm-hmm. you know, where I'm sort of in their heads, where where they, you know, many times feel like at 10 years old, they already knew everything that they know as, as a grown up. you know, mm-hmm. and they've had to obviously amplify it and fill it in. Mm-hmm. But they sort of had that instinct even then. Yeah. You know, characters that you write about. Be true for athletes where athletes would just sort of, they just know at yeah. age six or eight or something that they're going to. Well, you, you know, said something earlier that, resonated with me and then what Rachel just said too is you sort of said how am I crazy am I this am I that and now it's like you know ever like millions of people want to read and steam press field you know and we want to hear what you have to say but that's kind of what I was asking earlier like do you like when you're little you can kind of feel alone or not the same and life is so interesting how when you kind of start life and I this is just my perspective but you sort of start life externally trying to feel cool right like you start in high school and in college trying to be popular i think that's like a real thing right but then as you get older then you have to like break back that conformity and you have to individualize yourself and then you find people who are 30 40 and you talk to them and they know that they could do something but they don't know how to do it and then it's it's like these simple choices that they can't make and that's what I was I was kind of alluding towards with you earlier in the conversation of when you were a little boy and your dad was raised and he went through the depression and he was trying to get you to have this. But you knew, like, I have this in my head or I have this in my soul or my intuition says to do this. And 
it's going to be scary. It's not going to make sense. I'm going to be alone. I'm going to have to be a lone wolf. I'm going to have to do all of these things. And obviously you did it, which is incredibly inspiring to the two of us and hopefully everyone who's going to listen to this. But do you think that that is like, do you think everybody has that, but only so few people actually act on that in life? Like, do you think everyone feels different and unique when they're little? That's just a completely question that just came to my head as I'm listening to two of you talk. But do you think we no, all have I, that? I do. It's it's like what Rachel, what you said about the people. Does everyone have a call? Yeah, yeah. I do. think. I mean, I don't know if you're are you familiar with uh, Carl Jung, the famous psychologist? Yes. Yep. yes. You know that one of his things is about individuation. OK, mm -hmm. which is a great word, I think, mm -hmm. or sort of, you know, finding out who you really are. I mean, I'm certainly a believer, very much so. In fact, The Legend of Agra Vance, the book, is entirely about this subject, mm -hmm. is that we're not born as blank slates that can go, do anything and go anywhere. I think we're born already with a real defined identity. We, we already, I'm a believer in previous lives, the whole thing like that. Mm -hmm. But I think we, we come in you know, with our calling, with that person, whoever that is, and and our job in our life is to find out who that person is, mm -hmm. who we really are, who we always were. And the struggle, of course, is that, you know, in school, everybody wants to make you the same person, right? Yeah. You know, or well-meaning people, your parents, your friends, whatever, they want to help you, you know, don't do this crazy stuff and learn to, you know, work with the Yankees and try to empower them and don't do that. That's insane. Just be a teacher. Why can't you be a nurse like a you know, mother? You like know, my sister. Right? <laughs> and, yeah. and so that's sort of our lonely challenge for all of us is, and I think people aren't, like I say, they're not taught this. They're not taught that to believe in themselves or to, and I'm sure that's what you guys are doing. It's about empowerment of the, of the athletes that you train, right? Yeah. To, to let them believe in the, what, what's already there. Yeah. Um, and um, what so, was the tipping point yeah, for you? I do feel that everybody is born with some kind of destiny and they, and they are an individual and it's, and, and they are unique. It's already, it's all there already in the DNA. Wow. So what was My the opinion. tipping point yeah. if you, so, I mean, you already kind of described, you gave us a little window into your upbringing and very uh, practical parents. And my parents were very practical and grew up pretty poor and just had stable jobs that they didn't really like, you know, and here I am like living my passion, you know, that was just terrifying to them. Um, but what was like, do you have a key mentor? You mentioned like Hemingway and just knowing about some other authors, but did you have something like the tipping point when you were like, I'm not going to conform. I'm doing my own thing. And then you kind of went into that spin cycle of like having the normal job, living in a van, having the normal job, <laughs> living by yourself. Like what was the tipping point that you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to chase my dreams. Um, I'm not sure if there really was a, a, a tipping point of that kind. Um, I could name a few. Yeah. Um, I think there are multiple kind of tipping points like layers. Um, and usually for me, they really were sort of, they kind of followed the same pattern, which was I was about to give up. <laughs> and, and for whatever reason, I thought, you know, at the, at the last one, I said, no, I'm not going to give up, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and, and I would come up with another, another uh, crazy idea, you know, like one, ex here's just one example. Um, I was, I was finishing like my third novel that nobody would buy, could never sell anything. I could never get published. Everybody would laugh at me. You know, my friends would give me that look on their face, like poor guys going down the drain, you know? <laughs> and, and this was, I was in New York in living in a little apartment with my cat. So, so that's how sad it is. <laughs> and, and I finished this thing that I've been working on for two years and everybody hated it, you know? And, uh, and I really was thinking, you know, if I hang myself, you know, who's going to take care of my cat, you know? <laughs> so, and up to that point, I, my dream had always been to, to write novels. So in my state of despair, my partner, I thought, well, why don't I go out to Hollywood and try to be a screenwriter? I mean, 
that way I can fail at a whole other new thing, you know? Yeah. But that was like a breakthrough for me because I mean, immediately I cheered up. You know, my cat was ready to go. Yeah. And we just sort of packed up the van and headed out, to, headed out to Hollywood. So that as a sort of a turning point, there have been a bunch of those turning points for me, but it was like, you know, uh, being in a state of ready to give up, what they call in the movie business an all is lost moment. Have you ever heard of that phrase? No, I, I not, mm-hmm. not, no, not in that setting. This is a really interesting thing. I'll, I'll, yeah. Uh, if you look at any movie, because this is sort of Hollywood oh. storytelling. Yeah. Three quarters of the way through the movie, there will be a moment when, from the from the hero's point of view, all is lost. Mm-hmm. They're never going to get anywhere. It's you know da 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 da, and that's usually followed by an epiphany. They have a breakthrough, sort of like me saying, okay, I'm going to go out to Hollywood. And it's usually a totally crazy idea. It doesn't solve any problem at all. You know? <laughs> but that's a, a sort of a turning point. And I do think that in our lives, we all have lots of these all is lost moments. Mm-hmm. And each sort of incrementally you advance, you know, from one all is lost moment to another. I'll That's great. An, an example that I always use. Yeah. You guys remember the first Rocky movie? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's a moment in Rock in that movie when it's the night before the big fight. And, and, and Rocky's home. He's in bed with Adrian. If you can remember, I'll, I'll, maybe this will come back to you. He, and he can't sleep. He gets up and he goes down to the arena. If you remember this, all by himself. And he goes into the arena and it's empty. For the, for the fight tomorrow, right? Yeah. And he yeah. sees the big picture of Apollo Creed. She's the big picture of himself, all yeah. the empty seats. And he suddenly realizes, you know, up to that moment, if you remember, it was, you know, the Rocky theme song was playing, you know, he was running up the steps of the art museum. He thought, oh, I'm going to do great, you know? But he goes into the arena, he looks around, he goes to himself, holy shit. Yeah. He said, I don't have a champ. I'm fighting the champ tomorrow. You know, he's going to kill me. I'm an idiot, you know? And he goes home to Adrian and he has a really wonderful little speech where he says, you know, uh, who am I kidding? I'm a guy off the street. I'm just a bum. I'm going to, he's going to kill me. And then, and that's his all his lost moment. And then right in that moment, he kind of has an epiphany and he goes, it's while he's talking to Adrian, he says, you know, he's going to, he's going to beat the hell out of me. I know it, but you know what, if I can only go the distance, if I can only last 15 rounds with Creed, Nobody's ever done that. If I can just do that, if I can just take the beating, then he says, I'm going to know I wasn't just another bum from the neighborhood. Mm. And that's really kind of the whole point of the movie right there, you know, where he changes. Anyway, I'm probably lecturing too much, but no, I was dialed, uh, dialed in. And and also, uh, also you, like you said, you kind of, it made no sense, but you're like, Oh, I'll go fail at something else. But at least you're failing at a great feat. Like you're, you're not selling yourself short. Like I, I always tell that to people and to myself, it's like, well, I, I took a risk and, and changed careers and was, you know, Harvey knew it when I was trying to be a hitting coach to cross over from strength and conditioning to hitting no women on field coaches just this last year. And like, I, I mean, I knew that there was a chance I wasn't going to get hired, but I'd rather go for that and fail than just stay doing what I was doing. Yeah, so that is great. And I really take my hat off to you, Rachel. That's an amazing move that you did there, if you think about yeah. it. You know, when you're 30 years from now, you're going to look back on this and say, how did I ever do that? Yeah. Where did I ever find the balls to you know, yeah. become a hitting coach, you know? I mean, but, you know, God bless you. You you really were following your, you know, your inner calling there. Well, and that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you I'm off. I'm just going to say there will be many, many, I'm sure, evolutions for you going forward, you know? where your identity the all is lost a moments bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that that storytelling in all of your workings that you're trying, are you trying to, are you always somewhat trying to create that story just with different characters or different concepts or different principles? Y- yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, not so much. It's not so much that I'm trying to do that. Mm-hmm. It's that if a story is going to work, yeah does have to follow certain principles, you know, mm-hmm. just like if a jump shot is going to work from a distance, it has to have, you know, the right elbow has to be in a, you know, so what I am trying to do 
as I today am working on stories is become more and more aware of those principles and try to understand the nuances of them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I am constantly sort of teaching myself or learning the craft, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, a, I have a question. Yeah. This is this has been on my mind for a while that. here. I could feel that. <laughs> we're, we're getting really good. Um, what is the importance of being alone? Uh, through these evolutions, you mean? Um, I mean I'm going to leave it general. Ask but, that question a little. Get me elaborate okay. A little bit. All right. I was going to leave it general. But what's so you mentioned these times where you would go live in a place that was really cheap or you would live in your van. And I assume that you were alone for a lot of this besides your cat, of course. <laughs> um, but what a, what's the importance, or or maybe you talk about in your book and I don't know about, like you said at the very beginning, which I absolutely love, like facing the blank page and getting it out and letting the thoughts come to the surface. Um, what's, what's the importance of being alone and being able to reflect in order to get those thoughts out for you? A great question. I've never, nobody's ever asked me that. I've never even thought about that. Yeah. But I think that, I mean, I'm an introvert. You know, I'm definitely not. If I'm at a party, I'm the guy that's in the corner, you know. Um, so for me, being alone was a lot more natural than it might be for other people. But I think it's priceless being alone. And those, those are the times when you really really make progress when you really learn because you're you have to you have to face your own insides you know there was one period for me where i saved 2700 bucks that was enough to last me a year this was many years ago and i lived in a little house and i was like in, in northern california and i was just writing a book it was the first book that i ever actually finished I never sold it but i finished it and I was just alone and I would just write during the day. I had a couple of friends. I even had a girlfriend at one point there, but, uh, and I didn't have my cat at that point. <laughs> I would write during the day and I would read at night. And I would read all the books that a writer is supposed to read, but that you never read. Dostoevsky, you know, War and Peace, all, all those books, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and it was the best time of my life in a sense, because I was just, um, I think when you're alone, for a long period of time like that, first of all, you don't have to, it's a real selfish time mm -hmm. in a good way, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to worry about your kids. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry that your spouse is feeling neglected. Uh, you can just focus on your own shit mm -hmm. completely. And that's when, that's when you learn. I think, you know, I imagine Steph Curry must have spent how many hours in a gym shooting you know, jump shots from way beyond where everybody else was shooting them, yeah. you know, but at that time, I would bet if we could talk to him was, you know, even though he's a family man, loves his wife, loves his kids. He's an outgoing kind of a guy. I would bet that that was a really, really special time for him. Cause I think, you know, I, like I say, I'm a believer in the muse and I'm a believer that there are other dimensions of reality mm -hmm. and there are other, we have like little angels and, and muses and goddesses around us. When we're alone like that, we're alone with them. Mm. You know, we're alone with our inhering spirit, whatever that may be. Yeah. You know, and and we can turn off the noise and the other other people's expectations of us, and just you know just focus. So I think it's a great great question, Rachel. I think being alone, I don't know, maybe it's different for extroverts, but I'm not that. Well, I'm but, I'm extroverted, and I would agree a hundred percent, though. I, I've been fortunate to be alone literally a lot um living alone and and moving i move a ton for just everything and don't know a lot of people when i first get to a place but also like metaphorically alone in my career and just not having a lot of people to ask advice to which is good because then you listen to your own thoughts exactly yeah. exactly yeah. Couldn't agree more the other thing i think is that most people again we're not taught this in school don't know how to be alone or right. are afraid to be alone. Right. I mean, I was afraid to be alone. I was like desperately afraid to be alone. I was only be when became alone because, you know, I was forced to, I was married and the marriage broke up and I uh, blah, blah, blah. And I just was alone. Yeah. You know, I was such a creepy guy that nobody would hang out with. So I was yeah. Like, <laughs> and, yeah. And, uh, but, um, so nobody taught me and, um, people don't want to be alone. It's scary to be alone. 
right? Put it, some, I mean, put it, you in solitary confinement. It's like the worst thing anybody can do to you. Yeah, but, it uh, is. Well, we, we do with the pandemic now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where we're, I uh, love we're, it. We're, I don't love the pandemic. Now. Yeah. I don't love the pandemic, but I, I love the space it's afforded myself. And I hope that some people out there who are hating the time alone are slowly realizing that maybe this time alone is good for them. Yeah, I would hope so too. I, I think you're, I think you're right. Oh, I, I, I talk about this a lot often with the art of being alone because you you're forced to now have conversations with things that are real, right? Because there's nothing that you can distract with mindlessness, whether that's uh, yeah. uh, edu uh, entertainment, other people, these sort of things. When you're alone, you get you're forced to go. Why did I make those choices? Why did I do that sort of thing? Why do I make these choices? Why has my life gone this way? And I think that that in terms of your time as well, I'll, I'll kind of segue this to a, the finale. But we we usually always ask our guests what we call the diamond series. And so on the diamond series, we we call home plate being your purpose, then your standards, your systems and your vision. And that was what we kind of started with years ago. And we would figure out what could we find from people over having a podcast, we could understand their purpose, we can understand their standards, the systems they've established, and then what is always that person's vision out in front of them that gets them moving. And it's evolved over the years. But uh, when you talk about your introvertness or your being alone, your story, you, the way that you create a story, the, the principles that you have, uh, the development of the journey, moving from New York to Hollywood, all these sort of things, and obviously the, the Rocky story as well, just in general of just the all or nothing type concept. When you think about yourself, Stephen, in the sense of, again, peel it into your own thinking, we always ask people about their purpose or their why, but I like more so saying, what are you willing to struggle for? So what is it that you find worth struggling for that gives you a deep meaning or a deep purpose to keep going? So when it does seem like it's the all or nothing or it's about to fail miserably. All is lost. Yeah, yeah all is lost. And But you have the, the struggle that you found that's worth struggling for. I don't know if there's necessarily a, a clear defined answer for that, but in your frame of reference or frame of mind, what is it that has that has stuck or stayed tried and true in your world that the struggle has been worth going towards? Well, I like I said before, I believe that we are all born mm -hmm. as a as a personality already, as a unique personality already, and that we do have a destiny, mm -hmm. and that we do we were put here for a reason to bring something forth, mm -hmm. you know, and so. My purpose is to, is to sort of to follow that star mm -hmm. and it unfolds for me project by project. I have no idea where it's going, but, but to be true to that, whatever that if I have a destiny, my job is to live it out yeah. one way or another. And you can't really see very far down the road. So you just have to sort of keep going. So that's, if, if that's a, a purpose or what it, the struggle is worth that's what it is for me that is so cool that you is so cool who I am, yeah know? yeah it's almost like you're discovering new shades of you the whole time you chase yeah. the, the star yeah. in your in your journey and so when you do that obviously you have a level of standards right that you stick to in terms of i need a book done in a deadline i need uh this done at this time i need to take care of my physical health my emotional health whatever it is when you think about what you have to objectively check off in a day in your life, mental, emotional, and physical, what is sort of the things that you found, the staples of keeping you consistently moving closer to that star in terms of choices that you make? So are you grabbing that question? Basically, what choices are you making at your own personal set of standards, either mental, emotional, and physical that set you up to be optimizing yourself? Uh, yeah, I definitely have standards every day Yeah. in terms of, uh, I, I don't know if I could even articulate it, but I sort of know at the end of the day, whether I've lived the day fully or not, mm -hmm. or if I've wasted my time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm kind of a fitness guy too. You know, I work out and I do this and I try to eat right. And I go that, and I try to put in my time working on what I'm working on, whatever it is. And I try to, for me, it's a long, it's a long game. It's a marathon. Uh, you know, it, it's for the rest of my life. So I don't, 
I don't try each day to like push myself to the point of break utter breakdown, but I do try to push myself to the point in terms of of getting work done or just sort of uh, you know following whatever train of thought is in my mind mm -hmm. enough that I feel like I've really I, I've done a good day's work. I've earned my keep on the planet. You know, I've paid my dues to be on the planet. Wow. And, I tr and I do try not to overdo that because again, that there's going to be an another day tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I don't want to burn myself out. It's not like an athletic season where the season ends, you win the NBA championship and you collapse for a few <laughs> months. You know? yeah. it's, the season doesn't end. Yeah. So, but yeah, I definitely have some kind of standard. I don't know if I get to find it, but no, like yeah, what I get it. level of work I'm going to accept for myself. Have you found, okay, saying what you just said, because I've found it difficult for myself and I'm sure Rachel's somewhat in the same path, but I don't want to speak for you, but when you're trying so hard to get, so when you were trying so hard to get published or to get out of your rut or to make some money, so I don't have to have any financial fear or any sort of thing. Did you find yourself rushing then compared to now? Or have you sort of, have you had to master what you just said over the years? Like, have you had uh, to- That's a good question. No, I, I think I was still working. I wasn't, I was working as hard as I could then. Yeah. And I'm still pretty much working as hard as I can right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that we, I, a lot of athletes, including myself, like as an entrepreneur, even I dance with the, I need to burn myself, but then not burn myself. And then it's, you're just trying to balance that out all the time. And I, I feel like I improve on that or people improve on that. And that's why I was kind of leading towards, has that been something that you've had to constantly be like, oh boy, I did it again. I burnt myself or I need to go faster or slower and all that sort of the dance of life, I guess you could call it. Yeah, I know. I mean, I remember in terms of writing, mm -hmm. I stop each day when I start making mistakes, you know, when I start making typos yeah. and stuff like that. And I would think, you know, like if you're a golfer and you're out on the range and you're hitting balls, there comes a point of diminishing returns, right? Where you yeah. just know, you know, um, it's getting worse. If I just keep hitting balls, I'm going to get worse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start grooving bad habits. And so I'm definitely a believer that when the day's over, it's over. The office is closed. Mm, and, I love that. And, you know? Yeah. It's black and white. Yeah, yeah, the office is closed. Well, I'll kind of funnel, funnel you out here in, in terms of vision. So we talked about the star out in front, which uh, you're talking to two people who believe in dimensions and all these sort of things as well. So we uh, we believe in there's a greater, you know, there's a star out, there's an intuitive sense to life, there's a, there's a dreamer inside us all, there's a deep calling. You know, what is your vision? What is, you've done so much, you've written, like I said, I was I was trying to funnel in on turning pro and war of art. And then I was reading through all the stuff that you wrote. And I was like, I don't, we don't have a shot at getting through all this stuff. Like this guy has been writing for so long and done such a phenomenal job in, in crafting so much bodies of art. But with everything you've accomplished and things that you come from in these situations, what is it that excites you still? What is the future vision that you see that maybe you never attain or get to? But what is the discovery of you that it, intrigues you enough to keep pushing forward with excitement? Well, I, I can see, you know, um, I was watching, did you ever see that documentary, History of the Eagles, the band, the Eagles? No. I have not, uh -huh. no. Anyway, there's a really good part. You know who Joe Walsh is, mm -hmm. their guitar player? Yeah. Anyway, one of the things he said was, we had a lot of guitar players. He said, you're living your life and you're going through these random things, you know, you think, this has nothing to do with this and nothing to do with that. And then, but then when you look back on it, an order type of thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as if there had been a plan. And so I do feel like project to project, I'm, I'm evolving into some areas that I've never been before. And I don't know what they are or what's coming. Let's say, I don't know what's coming. Sure. But, um, but it is unfolding. So I'm just, it's not like I have a body of work that I want to produce, you know, before I die or anything yeah. like that. I just want to stay in the game mm. you know, and, and feel that I'm still, that I'm learning and that I'm not repeating myself. Mm. And finally enough, it does seem to work. You know, the muse keeps delivering something new. And 
and uh, so I'm just trying to follow that star. Yeah, you know whatever it is. That is so cool. Do you have anything to add on that? There's no end game. There is no end game. There's no. There's no. No, I don't think there is. We'll go on to the next life and pick it up from there. Yeah, you know? I'll see you there. Yeah. <laughs> That is so cool. Well, hey, I uh, just to, before I kind of thank you and, and get our closing remarks, just is there a way that people who are listening can uh, find out more about you? Is there a website? Is there uh, what accounts do you use? What are some of the stuff that obviously we'll we'll do some we'll showcase some of the books that you've written and whatnot. But are there ways that people from this can just find out more about you and follow you to a degree? Well, there, there is a website that's just my name, Stephen Pressfield. Mm -hmm. But if anybody wanted to know what other books I, I've written, they could just go to Amazon and they'll see those. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I'm also doing a, a little thing on Instagram now, speaking of evolving. Yeah. If you kind of follow me on Instagram, I've been doing a, a thing where I recommend books on leadership, but it's now evolving into a, I'm going to do like a whole... 50 part video series called the warrior archetype and that will be on instagram and, and other places if you just follow me on that yeah um, really cool so yeah that's how you can find it great that'll be awesome i'm everywhere yeah yeah oh yeah no that's awesome Do you have i love anything? he's like uh just google me just, yeah, just look it up <laughs> just, just look it up just find me well hey i from from my end man and i know you have uh deep thinking and a lot to, a lot to to do in life and to give us some time in that journey of chasing the star down man i really appreciate it i think that the, the anytime we get to speak to somebody to give away your time is an incredible high level of currency. So that's the, in, in our opinion, from our side of it, that's the highest level of leadership. And you've granted us with some, some high quality time and amazing stories. There were kind, kind of some times there where I went into my kid in the candy shop deal where I started listening to you going, Oh man, I got to ask a question. So, uh, so <laughs> I, I'm here. yeah, I apologize on that, but it was, uh, it was really cool to sit down with you, Stephen, and to get, your insights and really just inspiring just to kind of look at what Rachel and I can do and what people can do who are going to listen to this and to, to, to trust your intuition, to trust yourself and to really take ownership of the art that we can all create as individuals and sort of uh, service that to the world. It's just the meaning behind that would be incredibly gifting back to you if you just kind of trust it is what I've been taking a lot of what you're saying and and it's a really cool so i mean to give us some time this morning thank you so much from myself and rachel thanks and for having else. me it was, it was great fun meeting you guys yeah. and we can do this again yeah for sure that'd be uh, awesome can i get one of those livestone t-shirts yeah we'll get, yeah we'll send we'll, yeah we'll send them out when uh when, after this i'll shoot Let's you communicate note. on email or whatever after this and i'll, yeah. I'll send you a few copies of this thing yeah. so cool continue we'll continue this Wonderful. thank you this so much great. rachel great thank to meet you. you nice to meet you Keep thank up you the great work you guys are doing what you're doing i can tell it's going to be great and you're going to be great going forward thank, thank you, you. Steven. enjoy the rest of the day man thank you All very right, much you. Thanks we'll so talk much, to you guys. appreciate you it bye-bye